Thank you, Sunny. Thank you, Bill. If you guys are getting hot, we just turn the air on. <laughs> I was like, whew. <sighs> Who's awake? <laughs> okay. Most everybody. Most everybody. <sighs> so I'm going to ask you a question, okay? I want you to really think about this. So you heard Reverend Michael talk about this month, Science and Spirituality. So. If a memory is just an, on a neuron, a memory is an uh, experience on a neuron that sends an electrical impulse to the rest of the brain, right? So there's these synapses, and that's a memory. So how is it if these neurons connect and disconnect with each other all the time that we can have the same memory twice? If you win, if you know the answer, you can get a Nobel Prize because nobody's figured it out completely yet. I just wanted to see. I know our, our, our team here is, you know, a little bit smarter than the rest of them, but. You think about it a lot. Oh, okay. That would probably be right. Think about it a lot. So this morning we're talking about spirituality in the brain spirituality and the brain and I love learning about how ancient wisdom is now being proven by science because well we know it could have been proven a lot long a lot longer ago if we didn't have to separate right but um, science and and spirituality are reconciling and it's so beautiful and inspiring to to see what's coming forth and I can guarantee you that when you leave today like, I'll give you a money-back guarantee. Don't put any money in the plate if you didn't get anything out of it, okay? I can give you a money-back guarantee that when you leave here today, you are going to think about your brain in a whole different way. You're going to have a very simple way of supporting and transforming your life from this day forward in five minutes or less. That's exciting, right? Yeah. I guarantee it. But you have to, like, do the practice, so... Um, I can't guarantee you're going to do the practice. So, so what is a brain, right? What is a brain? Is a brain something between two ears? Is it something that sits on your shoulders? Yep. A brain is an intricate system of neurons and um, capacities for large amounts of information. It understand it takes an experience an environment and it breaks it down as quick as it can into into what it thinks is its reality okay so if I see if I if I just look around real quick and I see most of you smiling I'm gonna say wow this is a really great group they're very happy but if most of you are like intently thinking I might be like oh my god not, we're, we're, we're not vibing at all you know it's just the way the brain has to hurry up and and make its decision but the most important thing that we know about a brain is that it can learn. A brain can learn. So what if I told you that science has found that we have three different areas of our body that contain neurons, which are brain cells, in large amounts. Three different areas of our body. Isn't that amazing? And that is our head, we have a head brain, we have a heart brain, and it's very nice to see you here. And we have a gut brain. We have a gut brain. And I think that intuitively, many of us have known this, right? Our moms, our dads, our grandmas, our grandpas, or whoever say, follow your heart, or listen to that. Listen to your gut. What's your gut telling you to do, right? And so now we're, we're seeing physical evidence, scientifically based studies and structural um, experiments and data that have, uh, that have shown that yes, indeed we have three separate brains that all work together and communicate together through the vagus nerve. And so today we're just gonna talk about the heart brain, the gut brain, and 
how to how to inter interact with these three, how to integrate all three brains together. So before we get started on those, let's just talk a little bit about the head brain. What do we know about it? We know that the head brain um, has the ability to comprehend. To it is cognitive. It um, it's it's language processing, right? Which is why mo a lot of us can hear it better than the other brains, because we speak its language, right? So this is what the, the head brain does. It creates um, ideas, maps for us. But then we have the heart brain. And the heart brain is really special for two, two distinct reasons. First of all, the heart brain has fewer, fewer, fewer neurons than the head brain or the gut brain. The head brain has a billion brain cells. The gut has 100,000 brain cells, and the heart only has 40,000. That's OK, because it does something else that makes it really awesome, too. So the heart brain, when we, when we say that we love someone, just close your eyes for a second. When you feel that feeling of love and compassion, of, of joy, and, and oh, when you think about your children that you love or your partner, where do, you, where, do, where do you want to place your hands? Where do you want to place your hands? Over your heart, yeah. And now I know why. Now we know why. The heart, not only is it a brain, but it's part of the endocrine system. And so it's one of the largest producers of peptides. And peptides create, they trigger our um, pituitary gland. And our pituitary gland is what excretes the oxytocin hormone, which makes us feel love. It is the hormone that, that we feel love, that we feel well, that we feel connected to something. It is a bonding hormone, right? And so this heart center, this heart brain senses and it understands this emotion. And so when it knows that this is what it's experiencing, it sets off the receptors to tell the head brain, I need you to produce this because this is what I'm feeling. And so the head brain's language is like, I think, I understand. And then you got the heart brain that says, I feel. This is, this is gratitude. This is what I'm feeling. And the other thing the heart brain does is after 21 days of conception, we hear a heartbeat. And that's when we know that life has begun. And what is, what is the definition of uh, the heart stopping? Clinical death. Clinical death, yeah. You can live without being able to breathe on your own, but you can't live without being able to have your heart beat on its own. So the heartbeat, the heart brain, is the, the deciding factor on life and death in this biological form. And the ancient wisdom keepers, they've known these things for, for centuries and centuries. And they've been reminding us to listen to our inner voices, our inner language. And the... Um, there, let me tell you this, a little bit of this poem. The Vedas, um, the Vedic philosophy is a um, prehistoric Hindu philosophy and uh, scripture. And in it, there is a, there's a poem that they use to remind people to listen from their heart, from their heart brain. And it's very long, so I'm just going to share with you a part of it. It says... May fire be placed in my speech, my speech in the heart, the heart in me, the I in the immortal, and the immortal in Brahman. May the fire be placed in my speech, my speech in my heart, my heart in the self, which is the me, and the I in the immortal, that one and the immortal in Brahman. And in the same way, Dr. Ernest Holmes reminded us, similar to what Rachel said, that, that, thought, that feelings and emotions are thinking. They are a way of thinking. Feelings and emotions 
are a way of communication. They are a way of speaking to us. They're just not the way that we have been used to hearing. And then we have the gut brain. The gut brain is pretty awesome because like everybody's all about the gut brain right now, okay? You got your psychiatrists, you got the physicians, you got the scientists, and I'm sure you got the pharmaceutical companies going crazy here too, because the gut brain is so important. First, uh, let me just tell you what the gut brain is. It is the self-protector, okay? It is where we hold our identity. What do I value? Who am I and what do I stand for? And when something is out of alignment with that, we feel it in our gut. Ah, that doesn't feel right to me. I don't think we should go down that road. I don't think I'm in alignment with that person. What they're saying doesn't feel right, right? It's that gut instinct. It's that feeling that knowing, and it protects us. It protects us by allowing us uh, and generating fear and anxiety. And so did you know that 95% of our serotonin is held in our gut? And serotonin is the, one of the largest neurotransmitters in, in our entire body, and it helps us to produce the feeling of well-being of satisfaction, of contentment. And so let me tell you this story. There was a study done, and let me just say really quick, just stop for a second, that I'm not sharing with you a lot of the references, but if you want the references, you can go to pubmed.org. They have, they're, they're the very well-known site of like legitimate abstracts and, and, and studies, and you can just type in brain scans and mindfulness or da 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 Anyway, I'll help you with it later if you want. So 95% of our <clears throat> serotonin is created and stored in our gut. So what that means is that when we, our gut is out of alignment, many of us have other issues that are represented. I'll tell you this, this example. There was a study done on a, on a group of women, and each of them was hurt they had PTSD, they were abused, they all had things that they thought that they had worked through and they thought that they had forgiven because they thought that forgiveness came from the heart. But when something feels like it's attacking you and your personhood, that is the gut. That is the gut brain. And so what happened to these women is they developed serious intestinal issues. They developed um, chronic constipation, sorry for talking about this on Sunday, IBS, um, uh, serious issued intestinal issues. And so, the, so this is when they got the collaborative team together and the psychiatrist talked to them and they said, you know, what's going on? What, what, what are you holding in? Da, 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 da. And the physicians are looking and doing workups on them. They're all on antidepressants. They're all on anti-anxiety medicine and say, What's going on? Oh, and I, I have bowel issues, and I have this, and I have that. And they're like, <clears throat> well, this happened to me, and this happened to me, and, and have you processed it? Have you worked through it? Have you forgiven? Well, I thought I did, but the gut is still protecting us. And see, when we don't let out, when we don't know that we're supposed to, when we can't feel that we need to let out our pain, or forgiveness, or whatever has gone on that is trapping this energy inside of us, it starts to manifest in our body, right? And this is how it manifests in our body when we are out of alignment with our gut brain. Those are the kind of things that happen. And when we don't listen to our heart brain, it can get out of whack. And when we li don't listen to our head brain, Many, thing, we, many things can happen, <laughs> since it is like uh, our, our cognition, right? And so this is an amazing experience that the um, ancient Ayurvedic uh, medicine teachings, what they would do when somebody was feeling depressed or anxious or having a hard time, they would send them home to do a colon cleanse. And after the colon cleanse, they felt so much better. 
And there have been many studies that were done that showed that, that after these major colon cleanses that people were experiencing clairvoyancy and extrasensory perception. And so they asked the scientists and the doctors, why is that? What's going on? How, how, is, there all the, how is that possible? And so what, what the uh, neuroscientists were saying well, is that, well, when you're able to clear up all that space, the neurons have an easier time processing. So if you're all cleared out and the neurons are free and able to, to process the information and move it through, through that vagus nerve and up through the other two um, brains, then you're able to have a clearer understanding of yourself and of others. You're able to, you know, somewhat um, breach that veil between what our human body thinks is so and the endless possibilities of what is actually going on that we most times don't even glimpse. And so now that we've kind of just looked at these three brains, I want to I wanna share with you a couple practices that we can use. Very simple, very simple practices many of us probably already do every day, and we might not even know it, that really sets us in alignment. I say, I do it like this, but actually it, the vagus nerve really makes, goes from the gut up. Like the way that the communication through these neurons and this system goes is up, which is interesting. So the first spiritual practice, because what is, what, what, what is it, let me say this again. What does it matter if we learn anything, if we gain any knowledge, if we don't put it into practice? Isn't that just wasted space and time? I think so too. I think that is like a number one thing of mine. Like I'm not gonna go learn a bunch of stuff just to do nothing about it, right? So let's practice it so that we can be the, the information and the spiritual beings that we were meant to be. So the first practice is super easy, and it is just diaphragmatic, diaphragmatic breathing. So when we breathe from our diaphragm, we are, we are activating our gut. We are moving up through our heart space and oxygenating it. We are moving into our head space and oxygenating it because oxygen is what? It is the food and the fuel for our cells. And neurons are brain cells. And so it starts, to, it starts to create an energy. So you want to try it with me? Just three big diaphragmatic breaths. Do you know how to do that? You breathe in and allow your belly to fill up. And when you breathe out, feel it going up through your heart and in, out through your head and allow yourself to see the oxygen just infusing you, okay? So we'll just do it three times. How's that feel? Feels okay, huh? It's simple, we probably do this every day, but just taking a moment to become aware and conscious of the activation and the listening, because when you activate and you breathe and you imagine it, you're, you're kind of getting in touch. You're like, what is it feeling like right now? What is it trying to tell me? And what am I hearing? And then the other one is very simple as well. It's um, the ancient Buddhist monks forever, from ever there were ones till now, um, have always practiced um, chanting mantras. And one of the things that is important to remember about chanting mantras is that not only does it create like this mindfulness and focus, but also the deep throaty chants trigger the vagus nerve, which then brings our, our um, brains into alignment. So let's do three big, deep ohms. You can close your eyes if you want to, okay?
How does that feel? That took less than five minutes. I highly encourage you, if you practice no other spiritual practice every day, which I, I encourage a daily spiritual practice and a morning spiritual practice, and that can be one and the same, because in the morning, when we're fresh and we have yet to allow the world to impinge on us all of its thoughts and ideas, we can take a moment to create a foundation for ourselves, a foundation of who we really are, of the truth of ourselves and the truth of our life, so that when we move on in our day and different struggles and afflictions come and they try to, uh, you know, push in on our consciousness, we can say, whoa, 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 I know who I am. I'm steady, I'm strong, I'm grounded, I'm rooted, because I did that in the morning. And that was my first thought. And so if we just take five minutes and not even think, just breathe and deeply breathe and feel all of our brains being activated and know that, yeah, sometimes our head brain is going to tell us to do something and our heart brain is going to say, but I don't feel like doing that. And our gut brain is going to say, uh-uh, that's not the right thing to do. We got to listen to them, right? We have to listen to them all and they're going to argue and they're going to fight. But isn't it better if we listen and we can hear them all arguing and fighting and try and bring them into alignment together than just hearing our ego or our head because that's the one that we are always listening to? People don't tell you to follow their heart because they're just trying to say some nice gesture. They're saying it because there is this primordial uh, knowing and, and sensing that this heart center is, is a driving force. And people don't tell us to, to listen to our gut and to follow what it is that we really feel and to turn the other way when we don't feel like that's a safe way. They're not telling us that. They haven't been teaching us that for centuries just because the heck of it, because they believed it. It's because the spirit knows. It's because we live in one mind and that mind knows. And through that mind, we have brains of intelligence. Isn't this a beautiful, beautiful divine temple that we have? My God, it's so smart and it loves us so much. It gives us everything. But we have to work with it and we have to practice we have to practice every day every day we have to practice and so i want to share with you this last part because i want you to listen 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 to the words that sunny sings and i want you to hear this last bit of wisdom from the book there are three there are three brains which one are you listening to it says once they are aligned we start to experience the emergence of a higher level of consciousness. It will show up in compassion from the heart, creativity from the head, and courage from the gut. So next time our head is telling us one thing and our heart feels another, and our gut's screaming even another thing, let us just take a moment, just stop and breathe. That is what we have been given, this beautiful tool, this life-giving, useful tool for, of breath, because it heals and recognizes and transforms everything. Five minutes a day will transform your life. And so it is. <laughs>